Hello everyone, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth, I'm the Curator of Astronomy for the Lohman Planetarium. We're going to cover the dates of November 23rd through November 29th, and what we'll take a look at are some of the images that I captured recently of some of the events that I had mentioned in last week's episode. I want to share those with you all. We'll take a look at the great constellation Pegasus, it's conveniently straight up in the sky, and a star within it where an exoplanet can be found. We'll talk about exoplanets in general. And we're going to look at the moon, where it's moving through the sky, and where we'll end with the penumbral lunar eclipse that occurs by the end of the month. Let's take a look. So last week, there were some great space flight and celestial events to look out for, especially to take pictures of. And some of these events I did mention in last week's episode. I'm going to start with some photos I captured of a very important launch that occurred here recently. And I know not everyone has a chance to see rocket launches from where you live, but here in Florida, our museum is conveniently located near the Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral, America's space port. And what happened on Sunday, November 15th, was the SpaceX Crew Dragon launching four commercial crew for NASA to the International Space Station. This was called Crew-1. It's not the first commercial crew to ever go to the space station. There was a demo or a test flight that occurred early in the year of Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley, who launched to just test out the Crew Dragon vehicle and to see if it all works and does it safely. And that was a great mission. But this particular mission is the first official one to the space station, and it's a really big deal for space flight to have these commercial launches. So the pictures that I have here, two of them, the one on the left is a fisheye image, and this is called a streak photo. So this is a long exposure of the launch, and we let the camera just take in the long exposure, and it shows you a streak of light from the rocket engines, from the Falcon 9, lifting off from the launch pad as it made its way up, curving up into space. And of course, with launches, they eventually go horizontal to make their way around the planet so they can enter into low Earth orbit. You can see that in this photo here, gives you a nice wide angle, wide angle view of where we were. And we were actually near the launch pad, not right near it, but fairly close in a wilderness area. And it gave us a really open and clear view of this night launch that occurred at 727. It was beautiful. Night launches are always amazing. It lights up the sky and everything around you. And the picture on the right really shows that well. This is a, another photo that we took with a different camera and our planetarium coordinator in the Lohman Planetarium, one of my colleagues, Jason Schreiner helped me take this picture. And this is kind of a zoomed in launch streak photo. And it really shows you the fire coming down that rocket from the Falcon 9 as it lifts off and it lights up the water and the landscape around it. It makes for a beautiful sight to see. And so launches are great. And this leads me to other photos and even videos that I captured as well. Now the next evening using the Spot the Station website, I had a chance to video the ISS moving through the sky. You see that very large white dot here. But before the Crew Dragon docked with the ISS, after launch the night previous, you can see the tiny little Crew Dragon vehicle there with the four astronauts. So it was so cool to see that in the sky. This was with a zoom lens on my camera, but I had a chance to follow it, and you can see that Crew Dragon making its way closer and closer to the ISS before it docks later that evening on the 16th. The night after that on the 17th, I noticed on the ISS Transit Finder website that the space station would be crossing the very thin crescent moon. And this is a map from that website that showed me where I needed to be. Our museum is located here in Daytona Beach, of course. And not far from our museum was the path that I had to be in to watch the space station with the Crew Dragon attached now by the 17th cross the moon. And this was very low, it was only nine degrees above the horizon. So I had to catch it right before it set and it worked out pretty well. So with a camera attached to one of our telescopes, I focused on the moon and at the precise location and time at seven o'clock on the 17th, 
I was able to capture this video with the ISS crossing the moon, and there it goes. Look how quickly it moves. We have it labeled here on the next run. You can really see the space station. Remember, there are seven people on board total with the Crew Dragon attached, and this is 50% speed, so you can see it just a little bit better as the space station crosses the moon as seen from Earth. And the ISS continued to make its appearance in the sky because the next night on the 18th, there was a really wonderful crossing of the space station that moved through our sky in the evening. I did mention this in the last episode that you can use the Spot the Station website from NASA to look this up or other websites as well. And you can plan to watch the space station looking like a bright star. It's brighter than any star or planet moving through the star field. So here is a picture I took with some objects labeled. It's another streak photo, since I love these type of photos. And this is a fish eye from my backyard. And so if you look in the middle, you can see that streak all the way across. That is the ISS moving across. It's very bright. And across by, if you look in the southwest, you'll notice the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. So those were nearby, and the sun's light was still shining just a tad because it was near sunset just after six o'clock. We can also see Mars more to the southeast, a little farther from the streak of the ISS, and a few other prominent bright stars, Fomalhaut, you can see just above my house. And if you look north of the ISS, the summer triangle is visible with the three stars, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. So it's kind of neat to see the other celestial objects along with a human-made thing in the sky moving across very quickly with astronauts on board. Very cool stuff. I don't know if anyone had a chance to see a Leonid meteor or two, but last week I did mention the peak of the shower occurring on the morning of the 17th and even the evening of the 16th around there, but best in the morning. But no worries because the meteor shower runs all month from November 6th through November 30th, so you do have some time to catch maybe a Leonid or two. But I try to take a time lapse from my yard of this all night long around the peak. I didn't get too many shots of meteors, so maybe it wasn't as active. It's not one of the most active meteor showers through the year. Usually about 15 meteors can be seen per hour, and it does help to be in a very dark location. I'm not in the darkest spots, um, but here are a couple pictures that I pulled from my time lapse that shows a streak of some Leonids. And again, with Leonids or any other meteor shower, these meters can be traced back to the radiant, which can be found in the head, or at least near the head, of Leo the lion. And so that's why it's called the Leonid. So we can still anticipate some meteors coming from this this month. This is a great time of the year to look out for the very famous constellation Pegasus, the winged horse. And not long after sunset, in the early evening, and I have it set to about seven o'clock, if you look straight up in the sky near what's called the zenith, that's the tippy top of the sky at any given moment, and if you look near that area, you may find four relatively bright stars that form this large square. And we like to call this the square of Pegasus. That's the asterism. But the constellation involves a few more stars here. So if we look towards the west, you'll see some stars that kind of curve out in this area. This is supposed to be the head of this character, and then maybe some stars out here that form the legs. And you have to imagine some wings that kind of stick out south. So the horse will be looking upside down if you're looking kind of towards the southern area of the sky. Let's turn on the outline of this flying horse, and let's turn on the artwork to give us just a better view of what people imagined long ago. And in one version from Greek mythology, Pegasus was ridden by the hero named Bellerophon, and Bellerophon was a monster hunter, and he was very well known for slaying the scary multi-headed lion and goat with a snake tail creature named Chimera. And so Pegasus was involved with the slaying of that creature by Bellerophon from these ancient stories. One of my favorite things about Pegasus is that within this great constellation, you can find the place where we discovered one of the first 
exoplanets, so a planet outside of the solar system, orbiting around a main sequence star, a star similar to our own sun. And we can find this with Stellarium. If we move down to the bottom panel here, I have enabled the exoplanet tool, so I can click on this button, and it'll turn on markers for stars that can be seen either with your naked eyes or through a telescope, stars that have known exoplanets around them. So if you look right within the chest of Pegasus, right here, there is a star, and I'll click on that star, that's called 51 Pegasi, or Helvetios is the name you see in the top left of the screen here. And it's a fifth magnitude star, which means, again, it technically could be seen with the naked eyes, but you have to be in a dark location. So most likely binoculars or a telescope will allow you to see this star. In 1995, astronomers detected an exoplanet around the star. It's called 51 Pegasi b. Normally you label the exoplanet around a star by having the star name in front of it and then a lowercase letter uh, starting with the letter B and then adding other letters if there are more planets. So this was discovered by using a method called the radial velocity technique. And basically what you do is you notice that a star's light is either being stretched or squeezed. The wavelength of light is being altered. And that is happening most likely from a planet nearby that's pulling and tugging on its host star with its own gravity. And this is indirectly discovering the planet, but that's how 51 Pegasi b, or what's called Dimidium, was discovered. And there was a Nobel Prize actually awarded for this discovery back in 2019. The exoplanet was the first example of what's called a hot Jupiter, something we did not know existed until these types of planets were noticed in our universe. And the way this works is this planet is really big, a Jupiter-sized gas planet that orbits super close to its host star, closer than Mercury goes around our own sun. And it goes around the host star in only four days. It's so close, the temperatures get up to about 1800 degrees. And we did not think gas giants could exist in those locations, but this proved otherwise for us, and it opened up a whole new understanding of planetary formation. What's amazing is this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to planetary discoveries. The green dots I have turned on now are just the stars with known exoplanets that can be seen through binoculars, a telescope, or even your own eyes. But let's say we turn on the stars that have known exoplanets that can not be seen easily through a telescope, and it shows you how many exoplanets exist out there. It turns out most stars probably have them. And you'll notice a whole bunch here. This is from the Kepler mission, a space-based telescope that noticed, or at least observed, a ton of stars here with planets around them in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. This was meant to just look at one area of the sky, and it looked at stars and waited for them to dim a little bit when a planet went in front of them. It's called the transit method, and it's a very successful way of detecting exoplanets. And there's a new mission called TESS, that is another space-based telescope looking for exoplanets in our local vicinity around our sun. So it's exciting to know how many worlds are out there. Maybe worlds are similar to ours, maybe life on some of those worlds, but the search continues. And here is a snapshot from the exoplanet section of NASA's website. And it shows us that at the current time now, at the time of this recording, 4,300 planets have been confirmed. There's probably many more discovered, but to be confirmed really tells us that there must be a planet around a star. And that's quite a big number there, and that's going up all the time. And this website also tells you the distribution of types of planets and the most recent discovery. So it's cool to kind of keep track of this as we learn more about the planets in our universe. Tracking the moon through the star field, starting off the week, it will be in a slightly gibbous phase, so a little more than half full. And in the evening, it will start off in that celestial ocean I mentioned earlier with those water-themed constellations where we have Aquarius, Pisces here, uh, Capricorn, the moon was in last week. And so as we move through the week here, the moon will continue to wax as you're seeing more of it lit. 
And if we progress time forward, we can watch the moon on Tuesday the 24th. Then by Wednesday, it'll get fairly close to Mars. There's the planet Mars there. And as we continue moving forward through the rest of the week, 26th, 27th, and then by the weekend, the moon will then be approaching a full moon that we see later on on the 30th. And with that full moon, we have something quite interesting happening to it on the 30th, even though that's past the date of the Sky Tonight program. I'm still going to mention it because when our next program comes out, we'll have already have missed this event. So I want to mention it for this one, just one day after the week we're covering here to talk about what's called the penumbral lunar eclipse. If you want to enjoy this penumbral lunar eclipse, you'll have to be up in the wee hours of the early morning on the 30th. And that is when the moon, earth, and sun line up. It won't be a perfectly straight lineup. Then you'd get what's called a total lunar eclipse. That is when the moon passes in the dark part of Earth's shadow called the umbra, turns this kind of reddish color because Earth's atmosphere scatters the light from the sun and makes the shadow of Earth slightly red. So that's what we call a blood moon. But for this one, it's not lining up perfectly, so the moon's passing into the secondary shadow called the penumbra. And that's because the Earth is not blocking the sun completely, so there's a partial shadow going on. And so it's going to dim the moon just by a little bit, and it might turn a little bit of a rosy red color, but not as deep red as you find for a total lunar eclipse. To help us understand this, let's take a look at some information from NASA's Eclipse website. And this is the page that you get. I know at first glance it's a little overwhelming with all the information you see, but let's whittle down to what is important for general viewing. So if you look in the middle of the page, you'll find this nice diagram of Earth's shadow and where the moon will be passing through. So the dark red part is the umbra. That's the really dark part of Earth's shadow. But this eclipse is not going through that. So we have the penumbra, the secondary shadow, in light gray. And you'll notice the moon here at different times of where it'll be moving through that penumbra and so we have the first contact here at what's called p1 and the moon will be entering at and it says over here to the right at 732 and 21 seconds ut universal time so you have to account for your time zone for us on the east coast we subtract five hours to get 232 is when that starts so pretty early in the morning then the moon continues moving through the shadow and eventually reaches what's called greatest eclipse so if you look at the top of the page, you'll notice Grace Eclipse, and in parentheses, you'll notice the time of 9.42 and 49 seconds. So pretty close to 9.43 UT. Subtract the five, so you get about 4.43 in the morning for when the moon is fully in the penumbra. But it's not even completely covered. It's covered about 82% here. And then we'll move past that. And last contact here is when it leaves that penumbra, that's P4 over here at 11.53, 20 seconds UT, or 6.53 or so for us here in the East Coast. And again, you can adjust for your time zone. So that's how you can kind of understand the times there. And at the bottom, it's a nice map of the world that shows you the locations of where you can or can't see this particular eclipse. So for North America, the entire eclipse can be seen, so that's nice. And if you're in South America, only the eclipse will be visible at moonset. So you won't even see the entire thing as the moon is setting. Uh, if you're in Africa, parts of Europe, and even parts of Asia, you won't see it at all because it'll be daytime and the moon won't be out for you to see it. If you look over here towards Asia and Australia here, you'll find the eclipse will be seen as the moon is rising. So partially will be visible. And then moving back to the Pacific Ocean around the Earth over uh, to our neck of the woods here, uh, again, you can see the entire eclipse. So it can help you to understand how this works using NASA's webpage. If you plan on checking out this eclipse, you have to look towards the west. And for us here in the eastern part of the United States, this starts pretty early at about 2.32 in the morning, like I mentioned earlier. And it's showing this in Stellarium, actually, here at the bottom of the moon information at the top left. You'll see it says penumbral eclipse magnitude. And that's basically the percentage that the moon is within Earth's penumbra. And so we won't really notice much at the beginning of it, even at greatest penumbral eclipse. And that happens again at 443, 444 in the morning. We'll move into that time frame. And by then, we'll get pretty close to it at least right there. And by then, you'll see it says 0.82, so close to about 82, almost 83% 
that the moon is covered by the penumbra of the earth and that is not really something that you may notice it's just a very slight dimming of the moon so it's not a big big change to the appearance but something you may see and if you're a photographer it may give you kind of an interesting view of a full moon that's not as glaring and so that's kind of neat and then after that it leaves greatest eclipse and continues on leaving the shadow of the moon very slowly until about the six o'clock hour when for us here in the eastern part of the u.s is when it ends when the sun is beginning to rise and so it's kind of neat to plan for these events when the earth moon and sun line up not perfectly but sort of line up and that gives us this type of penumbral eclipse that happens every so often that concludes another edition of our sky tonight thanks for tuning in and as always i like to mention you can visit our loman planetarium we do show safely and every day a show is included with your admission or free for members so it's a pretty good deal and i hope you can tune in again with us digitally or in person thanks again and happy stargazing <laughs>